All right. I just uh, <clears throat> I just started the recorder, and um, I'm gonna go over maybe the last three questions of the previous lab. Yes. On YouTube, <clears throat> so you go to YouTube, and it's on my channel, which is some props. So if you just go to some props, you know, that will get you, go to videos, <clears throat> and there I have a lot of recordings. Yep, excellent. <clears throat> so I have to do one more thing because I want to use the tablet sometime today. <clears throat> All right, one more time. <clears throat> Okay. Scan. Super note. All right. Let's give that one more chance. And I just want to kind of go over uh, the last three questions, you know, because I, uh, I think there are, you know, a few people with some questions about these. So, <clears throat> particularly the last three, I'm not sure whether I can take the test in preview mode. Let me see. the The interface has changed a little bit from before. So. Mm. Doesn't look like I can easily take the test again. <clears throat> All right, so that that makes it a little bit difficult. Um, but I can also just you know kind of use this interface and give you you know we can think about some additional scenarios. <clears throat> All right. So this is all uh, previous material, and I'm just going to give you guys you know, some, a few new problems to work on. Uh, so we got X, Y, Q, K, and S. Okay. <clears throat> so what the lab was trying to do is to make sure that you understand the relationship between the digits and also how to use the functions R and C to come up with the answers. Um, so if I give you just the Y and Q, and I ask you to figure out what X is, the question is, can you do that? So I'm going to give you, uh, and also give you the base. So in this case, I'm going to use base 5, which is not in the, uh, in the lab. The lab uses base 6, 7, and 8, depending on the question. So I'm going to work with base 5 here. And we'll say that you know, we know the Q ends up with a 2. And whichever, what column this is on really does not matter, okay, because you know, it all boils down to the uh, relationship between the digits. So let's just say that this time I know y is, um, I have to be careful here. <clears throat> let's say y is 4 this time. I want to figure out what x is. All right, so if this is the question, you're supposed to solve for the question mark, and this is in base 5, what is the first step? What, what do you need to do first in order to answer this question? Okay, yes. Yes, so you're, you're doing two things, right? So you're, re, you're expressing the relationship between Q of I to X of I and Y of I, that's one. And then two, you're also going, you're trying to recall what is the R function, what, what it does. Okay. Do you guys have any questions? Nope. Okay. All right. Just wondering. All right. So, <clears throat> can someone tell me how our uh, Q of I is defined or how it is computed using X, I, and Y, I? I just mentioned it. He just mentioned it. Um, that's not the way we want to look at it right now. We say Q of I is the R of X, I, Y, I. Okay, the reason why I'm sticking with R of something is because 
if we just say that this is xi plus yi, the whole thing mod whatever the base is, which is five, that works in general, but it is not how we want to define R once we switch to binary mode, because when we switch to binary mode, we want to use Boolean operators to define all the functions. So I still want to refer to the R function, you know, to connect the Q, the Q of I digit to the X of I and the Y of I digits. <clears throat> so after this, then I go like, okay, but this is base five. If it's base five, I cannot use the Boolean operator solution for the R function. So I have to re resort to the addition and the mod in this case, this is modding five because we are, we're working with base five. Is that okay? So that means generally speaking, the way we answer questions or the way we process you know, these you know, questions is to think about definitions first, okay? You know, are there any definitions related to what the question is asking? I think that approach generally works, not only for this class, but also for your math classes, your physics classes, is to find the definitions, okay? Because all of these classes have definitions for you know, all the concepts. So now that we have two concepts, okay, there are actually two definitions in use here. One is how Q of I relates to X of I, Y of I. The second one is how R is defined. <clears throat> so now we have all of these things. So then what do we do? We plug in the values, okay? Now that we know what equations to use, then we can plug in the values. So X of I is the one that we do not know. We have to solve for that. Y of I is the four. And Q of I is the two. So we are basically asking, you know, what does X of I need to be in order for this to be a two? So, okay, but how do we do this, okay? What is the process to get this done? So we are asking something plus four, that whole thing mod five is two. How do we work this out? <clears throat> Say again? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Two minus, five. two minus five. That works too. Okay, so if you use the two minus five approach, then you have to understand what is modulo arithmetic, which is fine. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think the, the first thing is to remember what is mod, right? Mod is the remainder of a division. So we are really asking <clears throat> what divided by five has a remainder of two? Well, there's a whole bunch of numbers that fit that bill. 2 divided by 5 has a remainder of 2. 7 divided by 5 has a remainder of 2. Uh, 12 divided by 5 has a remainder of 2. The question is, okay, with all of those, which one is the right answer? Well, we, we know that you know, we, are, we are not looking at 2 mod 5 because this is already adding 4, and we know that x of i cannot be negative. So that means, uh, okay, we are ruling out 2 mod 5. What about 7 mod 5? Yes. That is correct. Okay, so what you said is right. Because X of I is a single digit in base five, which means how many choices do we have for X of I? Exactly five choices. Zero, one, two, three, and four, right? So now you now you're down to five possible choices. Even for people who do not understand arithmetics, division, and mod, now you just have to plug in one at a time. Zero plus four mod five is a four. One plus four mod five is zero, and so on. So by the time you're done with this process, you will find that, oh, three is going to work, okay? Because three plus four is a seven. Seven mod five is seven divided by five for the remainder thereof, which is two. So now we solve the, the problem. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> okay, let me give you another one. So we got X, Y, Q, K, and then S again. 
And this time we're gonna use, you know, we're gonna play, play with k. So in this case, I would say that k is known to be a zero here. It is known to be a one over here. And just unlike, okay, unlike the question that you tried out last Thursday, this time I tell you what y is. So I'm gonna say y is, we're still working with base five, okay? We're still working with base five. So let's just say that y is two in this case. And I'm asking <clears throat> of the range of x. Okay, let's, let's work on the range of x, okay? What, what value range of x can make this happen? So then, first of all, once again, how do we solve this problem? What is the first step? We are still using base five, yes. So what is the first step to solve this problem? The, the starts with the D. Definitions, very good. Okay, so now you have to remember what definition is applicable in this case. What are the constraints? What is given to us? What are you trying to resolve, okay? Those are the questions that you have to basically ask yourself and then, then you basically locate the definition that is going to be applicable in this case. What is given to us? K of i plus one is a zero. K of i is a one. Y of i is a two. Those are the given. What are you trying to solve? You're trying to solve for the range of value of x that can make, that can fit this particular constraint. So this is a constraint type of question, which means you, know, you are given a certain set of constraints and you're trying to find out what value of a certain you know, variable will meet these constraints. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So in this case, we use k of i plus one is c of x i y i plus c of q i K i, okay. <clears throat> the c is what? How do we define the c function? C of u v is u plus v. Oops. Okay. Screensaver. I should turn that off. So it's u plus v. The whole thing greater than or equal to the base question mark one colon zero. Okay. You probably don't need to write down everything because you know, this was something that we talked about last time and it is also in the module that you know, talked about this. So in terms of the definition, this should not be new. What is new in this entire discussion is how do you associate the question with the definitions, which assumes that you already know the definitions. Because if you don't know the definitions, there's no way you can say, oh, I think this relates to that definition because you don't know the definitions. So that means, you know, in your uh, review of the content, you know, you have to kind of make sure that you have a place you know, in your notebook that you write down all the definitions. So it's easy for you to refer back to the definitions. Okay. So we got all the definitions here. Um, and now the question is, we already know the constraint. We know um, x of i plus one is a zero. So we also know that c of u v, okay, u and v are basically just names of the parameters. C, the function c can only return a one or a zero. It cannot return some, anything that's negative. Which means if the sum is a zero, this has to be zero, that also has to be a zero. Does that make sense? So from one, from a few constraints, now I work out a few you know, additional constraints because what I have worked out is C of X I two has to be a zero. And then I also worked out C of Q I one also has to be a zero. Does that make sense? Is it all kind of logical? Okay. So now the question is, okay, uh, looks like we got two variables and two constraints, and you know, you go like, uh, are we really sure that we can solve this? Well, we only got one independent variable here. The other one is a dependent variable. Why do you, why why do you think that I said that? First of all, yeah, go ahead. No, x is the okay. I'll I'll give you a clue. X is the only independent variable. 
which means q of i is not an independent variable. Why is it not independent? No. That is correct. Q of i is derived from xi, yi. How do we know that? It's already here, right? It's already here. So that means, you know, familiarization with the definitions is really important. Because without the familiarization, without knowing the definitions, you know, it becomes really difficult to make these connections. All right? Okay? <clears throat> All right, so now that we know, you know those constraints, so the question is, what can I add to two, okay? Because you know, if you plug in these two to here, what can I add to two so that the result is less than five? You go like, zero works. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, all right. Yep. Yep. Okay. So Q of I is the R of X I two, right? So that becomes important because if you have X of I being two, okay, then you have two plus two being four, four is greater than or equal to five is false, and therefore we get a zero we meet the constraint of this zero. But Q of i is R of, in this case, 2, 2, which is a 4. And then C of Q i 1 becomes C of 4, 1, which in base 5 will give you a 1, so we are not meeting both constraints. So that means we have to step it back once so that we can now say, oh, okay, so X of i being 2 is not going to work x of i can only be 0 or 1 in this case. Um, so when x, one, when x of i is a 1, then um, c of 1, 2, okay, we have 1 plus 2 here being less than 5, it would give us a 0. So the first constraint is met. Q of i is R of 1, 2, which means it is a 3. So when Q of i is a 3, then C of 3, 1 is going to try to calculate 3 plus 1, which is a 4. Is it greater than or equal to 5? No. That means it also gives us a 0, so it would also meet the second constraint. Is that okay? Does everybody understand you know, how I worked out that in this case, um, x of i, this particular thing here, can be a 0 or a 1, but it cannot be anything higher than a 1. Are we good so far? All right. So I can almost guarantee, I, okay, let's take out the almost. I can guarantee that in this class, your exams, midterms, and the final exam are filled with problems like this, okay? Where knowing the definitions is the starting point of solving the problems. So you have to be prepared for those, you know, for those midterms and the final exam. So can, yeah, go ahead. The op the, they're open book and open notes, but open book and open notes only helps you in you know, when two conditions are met. One, you have the notes with you. Two, you know where to find stuff in your notes. And those conditions are not necessarily easily met. <laughs> Especially the second one. A lot of people think, you know, if I bring everything that is on the, on the Canvas you know, shell, print out everything, print out all the sample programs, print out all the circuits, you know, then I should have met the first criteria. Yes, that is true. But since I wrote those notes, okay, and I even I cannot remember where I put some of that stuff, the chances of you finding that stuff under pressure is not looking good. 
So knowing that now, what are you going to do? <laughs> A definition page helps, okay? Taking notes in class helps too, okay? After you take your notes in class, what do you do with your notes? Hmm? Sell them? Oh, okay. I, I thought somebody said, you know, sell them. It's like, okay, well, I guess, you know, that works too. Make a few bucks, sell it to your classmates, right? <clears throat> study them. What do you mean by studying? Mm -hmm. Try to, and you can use the lab. So you can use the practice lab because you know that allows you to basically redo things over and over again. There is a certain number of your know, actual questions, so you can exhaust you know, those. But unless you have a photographic memory and you actually do it a lot, you know you're probably going to encounter different questions as you redo those labs. So that's a that's a way to practice. Okay, and as you said, you know putting all the definitions in one place is going to help. Okay. And when you bring your own notes you know, to the exam, the chances of you being able to find where something is written or explained in your own notes is much higher than you know, just bringing something that I wrote and then you just go like, okay, I know it's somewhere in there. And then you just look at a big pile of paper in 10 point you know, font and go like, oh, and I only got 15 minutes left, right? You know, that's not gonna be a good situation. So that means preparation for the midterms starts now, okay, I lied. It started like a few weeks ago when we first started, the first class. That is when it should have started. But it's not too late to start now. Yep. How is it possible for that? Uh, Say that one more time. Um, okay, I never really said you know, which column this is on. Yep. <laughs> so this is not necessarily column zero. Yep. All right. Okay. Um, yes, go ahead. I'm not sure what you said. Go, can you repeat that question? What is a four? To get k is a four. Well, k can only go between zero and one. It can never be a four. So if we add one more digit to two, k would go over, right? So k one plus one would go over. If we add one more digit, one more digit. So, okay, it wouldn't be zero, one, for x. Okay, it wouldn't be zero or one for x. Okay, and then. So would then that, that k1 plus one over to But q cannot be anything. Q depends on x and y. You cannot arbitrarily and say, okay, q has to be blah, because your know, q is dependent on x, x and y. That's how we compute q. Q1, okay, let's assume this is column one. Q1 plus K1. K1. And uh, carry over K1 plus one. K2, uh-huh. K2 not K1 plus one. Well, one plus one is two. <laughs> not, not in the equation. No, it is, well, one plus one is two. I mean, you know, that's, that is universal, whether it's in the quiz or not. If you ask anyone what is one plus one, it is two. And unless you want binary, then it's one zero. So with, with uh, K1 and K0, does that indicate that K1 plus K, uh, Q1 has to equal four? K1 plus Q1 has to be four. You mean with S1 here? So we take K2 and K1 together, 
Uh huh. I'm not really sure what you mean. So maybe we should take this a little bit offline, you know, like after the class, you know, because if you can show me, you know, on paper, it would be easier for me to understand what you're asking. Okay, all right. So remember that question, okay? You know, when I see you at the lab or after class, you know, we can talk about that. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so what I really am trying to do is to make sure that you guys keep the midterms in mind knowing that those are open book and open notes and knowing that i will ask you questions that require thinking okay you need to know your definitions to begin the process of answering those questions so keep that in mind in every single class and also when you study and review the, your your own notes and also you know, read the material that i have written hopefully some of you have at least read that Okay, so those are the ways that you prepare for your exam. It is not something that you do a few days before the exam. A few days before the exam, you know, is not, you know, that. What, what you should do a few days before the exam is to make sure you have enough rest and make sure that you remember to bring the material that you have been preparing all this time. That is what you do the day before the exam, not to, you know, try to understand the material at that point in time, okay? So I'm just, gonna, I'm just trying to give you guys as much warning as possible so that people do not get surprised you know, on the day of the exam. Now, obviously, some people say, yeah, that, you know, that makes life really boring. I really like to live dangerously and on the edge. That's fine with me, too, okay? You know, but I do want, to know, I want you to know, you know what I would do to prepare for exams in this class. All right, so that concludes my little review of this material. And with that said, we are moving on and going back to this module here. I changed a little bit, okay, not dramatically. I changed a little bit, so when it had you know, XY here and R of XY, C of XY, I changed all of those names of parameters to U and B just so that we don't get confused you know, between, you know, the way I use the parameters in the function with the, the rows you know, that we use to describe the addition process. It's a minor change, you know, should not affect anything, but you know, I just want to make sure that we all understand that we got you know, that you know, update or revision in the notes. All right, so we are pretty much done with sections up to five. Okay, because I also built that circuit, okay, and some of you actually rebuilt that circuit in the lab time last uh, last Thursday, which is great, okay, because watching me do watching me do it and explain it in the class is one thing, doing it yourself is another thing, okay, just being able to understand, apparently understanding what I'm talking about in class, does not translate to you can actually do it when you're on your own. So I would encourage people to also, you know, kind of redo the circuit when you're on your own and hopefully not watching the video at the same time. So you're trying to actually remember what I said in class and apply what you have learned. Because you know, all of those exercises will help you build, you know, stronger pathways between the concepts, which means you know, by the time you need to problem solve using those concepts, they are easily, they're more easily connected, you know, when you're trying to answer questions. All right, so questions? No, no, okay. All right, <clears throat> just like infomercials, but wait, there's more. Usually means you know, there's a lot more, okay? So in this case, um, the problem with the adder that I have built the other day, it is by the way called a carry ripple adder because it does a rippling effect of the carry bit from bit zero, and then it propagates the changes all the way to the most significant bit of the adder. But that propagation is linear, which means the amount of time to finish the calculation is proportional to the width of the adder. A 64-bit adder takes twice as long as a 32-bit adder. A 32-bit adder takes twice as long as a 16-bit adder, and so on, okay? The circuit is easy to understand, it's easy to build, but it is not efficient. 
So what we're going to talk about today is how do we make a much more efficient circuit that looks ugly, like really ugly, okay? But we are going to sacrifice silicon or transistors for efficiency, for time, basically. We want to be able to finish these computations as quickly as possible. So the first part of this is really something that looks like this. If you have taken CISP 440, or discrete structure, um, you know, now that we you know, know the actual notation, you know, this is Boolean algebra, okay? This is basically Boolean algebra to derive the original <clears throat> equation, which is here, all the way to something that looks like this. I'm not gonna spend time to explain the actual steps of the derivation, because this is not CISP 440. But if you have taken CISP 440, you might want to test your knowledge of Boolean algebra by trying to follow the derivation. I spell out the actual rule of the derivation on the right hand side, which means you know you can actually just use that to help you to help guide your own process of going through the derivation. So what I'm going to do is to say, okay, starting with this, k of i plus one is boiling down to this all the way at the end. The, the thing is, I want to get rid of the dependency that if I want to compute k of i plus one, I need to first know what is k of i. You look at this, and you go like, attack, it's, this is not doing the job. Because look at this, k of i plus one, okay, which is what we want to solve for, still depends on k of i down here. So I have, after all this work, I did not achieve what I wanted to accomplish. Well, sort of, okay? But I'm getting closer, okay? I'm getting closer. So with the next paragraph, which looks kind of insignificant, I have actually changed this, the presentation of the next paragraph a little bit. It used to be worse, okay? So the next paragraph is basically saying, um, at this point, we define blah, blah, and blah, blah, okay? G of I and P of I. It sounds so trivial, right? It sounds like a re really trivial definition at a place where it is not, it's really kind of conspicuous, okay? It's not conspicuous. You, you would never suspect that these two, two definitions are important, but they are important, okay? So we are defining G of I to be X I, Y I, which means it is the conjunction between X I and Y I. We're defining P of I to be X I, or QI, okay? Remember, this is my notation. What looks like multiplication is actually conjunction. What looks like addition is actually disjunction, okay? So you have to keep that in mind. Yes? That is correct. Conjunction means and, disjunction means or. The reason why I refer to conjunction and disjunction instead of and or has to do with and and or is commonly used in the sentence anyway and I want to avoid that confusion. So when I want to refer to the operator, I would use the term conjunction, so that this way I can say the operator's conjunction and disjunction are blah, 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 okay? Because in that case, the word and, A-N-D, is a part of the actual sentence. It is not a part of the operator description, okay? So there's a reason why, I, you know, some, in certain contexts, I would refer to those operators by their formal mathematical name. All right, so with these two definitions, then we can rewrite this thing here so that we end up with this definition down here, okay? It's not really a definition, it's more like a derivation of what we had before. So when you, when you look at this particular equation, x, uh, k of i plus one is g of i plus, or p of i and k of i, it, it, it has to do with these definitions. G of i is x i and y i, which is here. P of i is x i or y i, which is over here. So I can just rewrite it a little bit, making use of the g and the p terms. Is that okay? It's, a, it's basically just substitution based on how g of i and p of i are defined. Yes? Is this the same thing as the C function? Mm. Oh, I see, I see what you mean. Yes and no, it is not a function. This one is spelling out that this 
the only way to compute g of i is conjunction. The C function may not be using conjunction depending on what base you're dealing with. So I, I wouldn't make that association. I would treat g of i being the conjunction of x and y, y of i, as a whole different thing. Okay? But that's a that's good recognition there, because they're both conjunction, but I would not make that association. Yep. That is correct. This only pertains to base two because you know, the Boolean algebra stuff here, that's Boolean algebra, meaning that it has it only works when stuff is Boolean. Yep, very good. This is only applicable when we're dealing with base two. All right, so you look at this, you know, finish the equation, you go like, well, that looks a little cleaner, but I'm still not solving the original problem that I was trying to solve because k of i plus one still depends on k of i. Right? Doesn't seem to help. Well, well, we'll try a few things, okay? So what we'll do is we're gonna try out, uh, what about k of one? We want to compute k of one using this generalized equation. Well, if I want the left-hand side to be k of one, what do you think i needs to be? i needs to be zero. So that means k of one is g of zero or p of zero and k of zero, which looks like this. Does that make sense? Yes? All right. So now we go like, okay, that looks okay. Um, what about k of two? There's a reason why I only show part of the equation. So if I want to solve for k of two using this general equation, what do you think i needs to be this time? i needs to be one, okay. So if i needs to be one, then I can re-express k of two as g of one or p of one and k of one. Does that make sense? This is just a direct way of making use of the general equation up here. And we just say that, okay, I want to solve for k of two, so i needs to be one, and that's why the right-hand side becomes g of one or p of one and k of one. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, then you go like, oh, well, that doesn't help because um, k of two still depends on k of one. We, we are trying to break that dependency. But wait, this is where the infomercial you know, clause comes in handy. But wait, we have already solved what is k of one earlier. k of one is already solved here. It can be re-expressed as g of zero, p of zero, k of zero. In other words, I can now do a substitution like a magician. Now you see k of one, now you don't. Is that okay? All right. But I'm not stopping here. I extended one more step, okay? This is Boolean algebra, but it looks like distribution in normal algebra because it kind of works the same way, okay? So by using distribution, I go from the second line to the third line. So the k of two is now expressed as g of one or the conjunction of p1 g0 or the conjunction of p1, p0, k0. Yes? K of zero is an input pin. So that's why, you know, just like in the circuit, remember the circuit that we built the other day on last Thursday? K, uh, the carry in is basically k zero. K zero is one of the input pins. So there's no way to compute k of zero it is simply something that you have to feed to the adder. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we want to work with k of three, same thing. So if you plug in and you say, I want to resolve k of three, then i needs to be two. So the other side becomes g of two or p of two and k of two. That's exactly what we have here. When you go like, but wait, k of two can be expressed in this particular way. So now, magically, k of two is no longer appearing in the entire equation. Now, does that make the equation or does it make the formula complicated? Yes. We're gonna have to use some silicon to do this. But 
we don't have the linear dependency anymore. K of two does not depend on K of one anymore. K of three does not depend on K of two anymore. Everybody only depends on the P, the G, and K zero. Okay, so let's go to, all the way to the bottom here. So now we can see that how K three is after the distribution becomes G of two with a disjunction conjunction of P2, G1, and so on. So you look at this and you go like, okay, uh, I can see that we are removing the linear dependency between K3, K2, and the dependency between K2 and K1, but we make the equation or the expression more complicated. Are we really saving time in this case? The answer is, it depends, okay? That's usually my standard answer when someone asks me, so is it this or is it that? The answer is, well, it depends. So in this case, it depends on who is doing the math. If the answer is you, you're doing the math, then it is actually not gonna save you much time because you can only do, you can only work out these expressions linearly, okay? Which means, oh, okay, you know, removing that dependency doesn't make things go any faster. In fact, it might go slower because you know, when people go through these linear, you know, I, I shouldn't say linear, when people go through these more complicated uh, formulae, it would take us longer. But we try, remind me again, what is the purpose of this class? When I talk about computer architecture, are you working out all the Boolean values or is something else working, on, working out the Boolean values? the computers, and what is inside the computer? Transistors, and out of transistors we can make NAND gates, and out of NAND gates we can make everything else, which includes AND gates, OR gates, right? Okay, so, but still, I mean, it still doesn't seem to speed things up, because as we go, the equation or the, um, the formula, the expression gets longer and longer. So there are still more terms to compute, and then you know, we have to compute this first, then we compute this, then we compute this, and then we compute this, and then we compute that, then we compute this, and then we compute that. Do you think that is the order? When I ask those questions, the answer is no, okay? Because when we read these expressions, it is linear to us. When we build the circuit, it doesn't have to be linear, okay? So what I'll do is I'm going to graphically show you how these circuits are built so that they are not linear, okay? Um, okay, I have to figure out how to do this. Okay, I know how to do this. Okay, I'm pulling this on the side so that you can focus on, oh, I cannot do that, can I? Okay, I have to put this back here. There we go. All right, so now you can see this, and I need to refer back to the equation, which is, where is it? Oh, I got it. There we go. Okay. All right, so I'm going to rewrite the entire equation here so that you can reference it. Okay, so K3 is uh, G of 2 plus the conjunction of P2, G1, or the conjunction of P2, P1, G0, or the conjunction of P2, P1, P0, K0. Okay, so this is just a copy of what you saw earlier in that screen. Okay, so now the question is, how do we structure the gates to get this done? Okay, does everybody understand the question? You know, how we are gonna structure the gates, okay? All right, so we're gonna say, hmm, what do we need, you know, to get this done? Looks like we got, we need all the uh, Gs, we need all the Ps and K zeros, K zero. So we need K zero as an input, we need G zero, G one, G two, P zero, P one, P two as input pins. And all we are trying to do is to compute K of two on the other side. So now the question is, um, what kind of gate do we need? 
Well, what if I tell you that logic gates, unlike operators, can have multiple inputs? So that means the usual gate that we have encountered up to this point, they all have two input pins. Well, but we are not restricted to only have two input pins. You can have a imp three input AND gate, you can have a four input AND gate, you can have a five input AND gate, and so on. Is that part okay? Are we understanding that um, it's, it's basically a, um, a difference between the operators, conjunction and disjunction, versus the logic gate that can implement those operators. So that means the first thing we know is if we want to compute this outer OR, we can now have a single OR gate that has four inputs in order to compute K of two. Okay, so let me draw that OR gate. So here's the OR gate, okay, and the OR gate computes K of 2. One input of the OR gate is corresponding to G2. One input of the OR gate is corresponding to P2G1. One input of the OR gate is going to correspond to P2P1G0. And the last input of the OR gate is going to correspond to P2P1P0K0. Okay. Is that concept doing okay with you guys? Because what the focus of this entire discussion is when we work on operators, binary operators, we, ha we can only have two inputs, then we have to compute the value of the operator, and then we stack it to the next operator. But when we are doing this using logic gates, one single logic gate can have multiple inputs, which means as soon as the four inputs of this OR gate is presented, the OR can be done in one single, what we call propagational delay. I'll explain that term later. Yes? How, do, how does the circuit then, how does the circuit work? It doesn't know which one to use. It basically computes the OR or the disjunction of all four at the same time. Yep. Okay, so I think I know what you're trying to ask. So let me see if I can find answers to that. So what you're looking for is a four input or gate in transistors. Um, that's the OR gate, which looks like an AND gate, except you know, the types of the transistors are opposite to what we talked about you know, the, other, the other day. And look at this. This is also generated using Logisim. Okay, but that's not answering the question that I was asking. Uh, for input AND gate. Okay, this is not what we want because it's stacked. There we go. Okay, this is a NAND gate using uh, eight transistors. So basically you have A, B, C, D as P channel or P type transistors. And then you have, oh, okay, never mind. So the A, B, C, D refers to the input. You have the top portion of the circuit made out of P type transistors and the bottom part of the circuit made out of N type transistors. So the output, if you tap this particular node, the output is the negation of A and B and C and D. So this, this is a four input NAND gate. And the discussion of how to use NAND gate to implement you know, um, AND, OR, and stuff like that, it's still true. So that means that you know, we can use stuff like this to build a four input regular AND gate, a four input OR gate, and so on. Mm, no, it simply computes a and B and C and D and then negate the whole thing. That's what this circuit does. Okay, wait, that is not possible. <laughs> what do you mean by going to the same place? No, 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 you have four input pins now. 
A, B, C, D are the four input pins, and then this is the output pin. That is correct. Nope, everything is simultaneous. Everything is simultaneous. The moment the A, B, C, D input pins you know, have set, they have changed, it will take a very short amount of time for the output to become the NAND of A, B, C, D in this case. It's a continuous process. The moment you change one of the pins, the output will change you know, after a very short propagation of delay. I, I'll explain that term in just a little bit. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. You, are you still referring to this circuit? Yeah. And your question was? So if you look at the first circuit you showed, right? This if first. It was, it was similar, similar thing for the time. No, you mean this circuit? This is a NOR gate. The first lecture. Oh, the first lecture, OK. Yeah, it only has one and it has one. Yeah, yeah, so. And then we have, uh, like, like, Say that one more time. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's think about this, okay? Let's think about this. I'm looking at the output here. What can make this output connect to ground, which is the zero? I need which transistors to be conducting, to be on. All of the, no, 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 ABCDs are the input. They're not the name of the transistors. What transistors need to be conducting in order for the output of this circuit to be a zero? All the N types, right? These are the N types. So how do we turn on an N type transistor? No. The gate has to be opposite to the source. And with an n-type transistor, what is the source? Zero. So that means the gate has to be what in order to turn on the transistor? One, that's right. So when A, B, C, D are all ones, then the output becomes a zero, okay? So the, so the flip side of that question is, what if one of A, B, C, D is a zero? Well, if one of ABCD is a zero, then one of these n-type your transistors will be off, which means the entire series is not con connecting. So you have no path to go to zero. At the same time, whatever input is a zero will turn on the corresponding p-type transistor, which means your output would then find a path to go to a one. That means the output is a one. So that means you still have a NAND function, you still have a NAND operator. Instead of a binary operator, it is a quad operator. It has four operands, okay? It is doing the NAND of all four operands at the same time. Does that make sense? Yes? If we went to the P transistor, so the input from the NAND is uh, zero, then it gets power going to the P transistor. Then the output, the, output be a zero. the output is connected to power because if at least one P transistor is on, then the output connects through that one transistor that's on to power, and power is the source of one. So it is still doing the NAND thing. Basically, it's saying if you want the output to be a one, then you only need at least one of the input to be a zero. If you want the output to be uh, zero, you need all the inputs to be ones, which is exactly the negation of AND. Except this time you have four inputs instead of two. Yep. Um, 
In the, in the case of an OR gate, it means if at least one input is a one, the output is a one. If all the inputs are zeros, then the output is a zero. That is correct. That is correct. Yep. 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 Getting back to the uh, the diagram. It basically means, okay, let me get back to the pen here. It means that you know, once you have these components independently figure out, okay, and you feed all of these through the same four input OR gate, then it will take a very short amount of time to compute the OR of those four inputs. Okay, so now what is the rest of the circuit? Well, the first one is G of two, and we just say, okay, G of two, why don't you just connect to this wire here? No gate here, okay? The next one is P of two, G of one. P of two, G of one. Okay, fine, we'll put an AND gate here. So we have G of one going to one of the inputs here, and then P of two going to the other input here. And this goes to the one of the, the other one of the other inputs of the OR gate. And now we have P of two and P of one and G of zero. Uh, okay, that's gonna look ugly, but it's okay. We are used to ugly now. Okay, this goes to one of the input. This goes to the other input. And then this goes to yet the other input. The output of this thing goes to you know, the second to the last input of the OR gate. And now we have P2, P1, P0, K0. Okay, so that's the ultra ugly AND gate. So K0 goes to one of the inputs. P, all the P's, okay, we need all the P's now. So we have, okay, let's see, this one is easy to draw here. This one goes here. And then we just need P0 to go doop, doop, like that. All right. So here's the question. I know the picture looks really ugly, but it gets the point across. So as it turns out, the propagational delay of this two input AND gate this three input AND gate and this four input AND gate, in theory, are the same. Okay, they take you know, basically the same constant time to compute. Just looking at the picture, do you think these three AND gates, okay, one, two, three, do you think they can start computation at exactly the same time? Or do they have interdependency, like, oh, wait, 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 you cannot start until I'm done. What do you think? Just looking at the wiring, can they compute at the same time, can they start at the same time? Yes. Well, they would start at the same time, but they may end at slightly different time. If you want to take your know, propagational delay into consideration, okay. So the answer is yes. They would start at the same time, and in theory, they will end. They will finish at the same time too. So that means if I want to look at a stage in terms of time, this is one stage. They all occur at exactly the same time window, window of time. This is the second stage because this one cannot get the right output until the inputs are correct. So this is a two stage, um, basically a two stage architecture of logic gates. Okay. So now let me go back and explain what is a propagation of delay. And before we do that, let me take row first, okay? Because you know we we can probably take a short break <laughs> to do this. Okay, give me a second. I need to pop the other screen back on. Yeah, today is all right. I'm just going to check the time and make sure that it is still in time. Yep, it's still in time. The passcode is look ahead. Let me uh, move this window back here. There we go. 
All right, so uh, if you refresh your Canvas shell and look for 20240130, it will give you a quiz, and then the, uh, the access code is look ahead. Because that's the name of the circuitry that we are looking at. It is called the carry look ahead circuit, or the carry look ahead adder. I'll put that word over here, so for people who are lagging behind a little bit, you can refer to this. Look ahead as one word, all lowercase. And I'm gonna go back to explain you know, why there is a, what we call a propagational delay in a very brief way. So maximize the screen. And, oh, okay, I don't need that. All right, so I'm gonna go back to this circuit here, which is just a glorified version of the two input NAND gate that we talked about. <clears throat> the reason why there's a propagational delay or that why there's a delay between the changes of ABCD versus the output of the NAND of ABCD, why there's a slight delay, has to do with, in the circuit diagram like this, everything is ideal. The conductors have zero resistance, zero inductance, and then the transistors do not have any capacitance. In reality, guess what? Things are not ideal. Transistors like these are basically, um, the connection between the gate and the rest of the transistor is basically a capacitor, okay? So there's capacitance between the input and the rest of the transistors. It's called capac it's, cap it's a capacity, it's a capaci capacitor, okay, that's the name of this component. It's a capacitor. And then the wiring connecting everything together, and also when current go through this, the transistor, there's also resistance. So when you have inductance, resistance, and also capacitance, it means it takes time for things to change. The moment you know, let's say A is going from a low, a zero to a one, that change cannot be immediately affecting this transistor because it takes time in order to charge up the capacitor. Especially when you're charging through a resistor, there's an RC constant. For those of you who have taken electrical circuits, you know, you will see you know, there's an RC constant to ramp up the voltage you know, on the gate. And then there's also you know, inductance involved but the bottom line is because of physics, okay? There's a time delay between the changes of the input ABCD versus the output correctly reflecting you know, the NAND of ABCD. That's just a very short delay. Typically, that delay is measured in a single digit of nanoseconds, so it's not long. Okay, if you're talking about one single stage of gates, it's not long, but you know, since we have chains of you know, gates you know, in the operation of a computer, that can be really long. Yes? No, the, the resistance is also coming from the conductance of the transistor itself. So when the transistor quote, quote unquote turns on, it is not a perfect uh, conductor. It has you know, built-in resistance to it. You're measurable in, I guess, a you know, fraction of an ohm. But resistance is resistance. You, it will still take time. You know, it will still restrict the flow of electrons. And therefore, you, know, you cannot just instantaneously build up current. You cannot instantaneously change the voltage on the other side. Um, it is it's a trade-off. If you want a transistor to have low resistance, you need that to be bigger but a bigger transistor has a higher capacitance, which means it will take longer for the gate to affect the actual conductance of the transistor. So it's a trade-off. Um, and right now we have you know, four nanometer you know, transistors. Um, I don't think we can go much smaller than that you know, because we are hitting you know, quantum physics um, limitations. Um, so you know, it, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see what's gonna happen in the next, you know, uh, generation of you know, processors, you know, whether they can still make it smaller. All right, so getting back to this discussion, 
So the bottom line, okay, getting back to this diagram, is the moment you know, all of these pins are settled, the moment these you know, pins are correctly reflecting the calculation that you want, okay, x, y, k0, you know, are the inputs, then it will take this much time because each one of these AND gates is going to take some time from the moment the input is correct to the moment that the output is correct with respect to the input. So it takes a little bit of time for all three to work in the same frame of time so that you know, the, these three wires going into the OR gate will then be correct. But it will also have a slight delay for the OR gate in order to come up with K3 this time. Sorry, this is my mistake. I apologize. This is supposed to be K3, not K2. So in order for K3 to be correct, it will take a little bit of delay from here to here. So the, from the moment the input of the four input OR gate are all correct, okay, to the moment the output of the OR gate is, res, is correct with respect to its input, there's a slight delay as well. So in this circuit here, there are two stages of delay. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So can someone imagine you know, what the circuit would look like for K2? It's going to be simpler, right? But it still has two stages. What about K64? It's going to be really ugly, okay? But how many stages do we think do you think we have? Two. That's right. So that means all the K values from K1 all the way to K64, if you have a 64-bit adder, they can all be computed at the same time. As opposed to Okay, I got K0 as an input, here's K1. Okay, I got K1, now we can compute K2. We got K2, now we can compute K3, and so on. That's carry ripple adder, which is the circuit that we worked on last Thursday. This allows us to go like, okay, here's, a, here's the X, here's the Y, go compute the G and the P. That takes one delay, right? Because the P's are the disjunctions of the X and Y, the G's are the conjunction of the X and Y's, which means it is just using a OR gate or an AND gate in either case. That's one delay. Once we have all the P's and the G's, G, P, K0 was available to begin with, then we have this scenario. It would take two additional stages in order to get all the K's done at the same time. So this particular mechanism is called the, the carry ripple, excuse me, take it back, carry look ahead adder. And that's why we have to look ahead as today's access code. Yes? Not exactly. <laughs> So the, way, the, why, the reason why we call an, a processor 64-bit is because it is capable from the software perspective of computing the addition of two 64-bit integers. Now, internal to the processor, um, is it using a um, carry look-ahead adder that can compute all 64 bits at the same time or not? We don't know, okay? So typically, you know, people do not make truly a 64-bit look-ahead adder because you know, the number of connections that you need to make this happen is enormous. And routing resources is the first thing to run out when we are routing transistors on, a, on, a, on, a, on an IC, on an integrated circuit, on the processor chip. So that's why you know, typically they don't do it exactly like this. Um, I'm going to assume that they have 16-bit you know, adders that are truly carry look ahead adders, and then they they chain the 16-bit adders, like four of those, they would chain them together to become a 64-bit adder. So so you're still saving a, an enormous amount of time, but it's not truly, you know, having all 64 carry bits done at the same time. Mm, not exactly, okay, so 64-bit, refers to both the path of the data bit and also refers to the width of the address bus. Um, so it has to do with 
how what is the width of the integer that we can perform addition in this case your 64 bit right so that's cool it also uh, has an effect on the address bus which means you know, how many bytes can the processor address theoretically 64 is a huge number already because 2 to the power of 64 would be the number of individual byte locations that are addressable when you have a 64 bit address bus and we are not running out of that just yet. There's no need to go further, that's correct, yet. Because people, when, when we had 32-bit processors, people say, oh, there's no need to go any further because you know, we are, there's, there's absolutely no need to go beyond you know, four gigabytes at a time, right? So who wants to have a new computer that has four gigs of RAM? I can do this, I, I use Linux but not the rest of you, right? How much RAM do you need on the on on a on a PC, on a regular inexpensive PC now? At least eight, I think Windows 11 prefers 16. If you, if you want to load the, op yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I think 16 gig is the standard now, you know, if you have Windows 11 installed. If you intend to do anything other than lo just loading the operating system, you probably need about 16 gigs. Yeah. What disk are you using? Um, I use Debian. I'm lazy. All right. So this is really uh, the the kind of the crux of you know today's lecture. This is the, the the key point of today's lecture. So let me go back to the lecture itself and kind of look forward a little bit. Okay, let me maximize this first. There we go. So in general, okay, this is what I really like. So in general, if I want to figure out what is K of 64, how do we figure that out? So we say, okay, if this side needs to be specified in 64, then N has to be 63, okay? And what is this thing here? Okay, so the first thing is, are you familiar with the sigma notation? Okay, this is the, it's almost the same thing as a, as a sigma notation. Tell me what operator is related to the sigma notation? Plus addition, right? Okay, can someone imagine what operator is related to this operation? Or what about this one? And, okay. So it really is the same thing, okay, same structure, same concept as a, a sigma notation, except we are not adding things. We are oring things, we are ending things. That's the only difference. So if you know how to read a sigma notation, this is something similar, although it looks you know, very different. So for those people who say, no, I'm still not envisioning how to do this, I actually have the code here. So this is a big AND, okay, and this is the big OR. So the big AND and big OR operation is really just ending a bunch of stuff or ORing a bunch of stuff. Um, I actually wrote a different module that may better explain the big AND and big OR notation. Give me a second to get to that. Um, let's see. Let's see. Big. Okay, maybe I don't have it attached here, so I'm not going to talk about it. All right, so first thing is, okay, let me see what time it is, 46. Ah, okay, may I, I may not have enough time, but that's okay too, because I want you to do it. Since I don't have enough time, you're going to have to end up doing it. This is not hard. I'm not trying to ask you to make K of 64. That would be insane. I don't want to do it either. I will not give you guys something to do that I don't want to do in the first place. I will give you something to do that I enjoy doing, which most people do not like anyway. Anyway, so I want you to use this to figure out K of three, that's it. So if I want to get, figure out K of three, that means N has to be two. So that means this OR is going to go through I being zero, I being one, and I being two, right? When i is whatever value, then we have this inner loop here where j starts with whatever i is plus 1, and it also wants to go to n, which in this case is a 2. 
this whole thing needs to be figured out. It is independent to this whole thing here. So I want you to spend some of your time because you're supposed to spend two hours per hour of lecture anyway. So I'm just planning out how you are going to spend your time. So figure out k of three using this particular formula. Now, if by Thursday you go like, okay, I still cannot work on, I still cannot get this figure out, I'll give you the answer, okay? I'll work on it step by step and give you the answer. But I want you to give it a try at least, okay? Because I want you to understand how to read this notation. Yes, go ahead. When a human is doing it, yes. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm doing it right. Yeah, when a human is doing it, you're doing it sequentially. But when the logic gates is doing it, then you can take multiple inputs and compute the result at the same time. When you have a bunch of ands or when you have a bunch of ors, you can have one single gate to perform those operations. Yeah, go ahead. The or is, no, 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 no. The or is or, okay? Or and addition are two different things because one or one is one, but one plus one is two. So all of these are logical operators. They're not arithmetic operators. Even though they look like it, they are not. All right, so I will give, need to give you guys the access code of tonight's lab. Okay, so let me get to the lab first. So tonight's lab is called multi-bit stuff. <clears throat> and the access code is da -da -da, multi, M-U-L-T-I is the access code. But read the beginning page first because it contains instruction and explains a certain concept. If you read it first, it will really help you with the rest of the activity, okay? So don't skip all the way to question one. Read the opening page of the quiz before you get started. I'll see you guys over at the lab.